So, okay, well, um, as they already say, uh, I will be talking about revolution I'm sorry, revolutionizing industries, uh, how AI is changing the game. The main goal with this is to talk about how AI is being used nowadays, uh, what industries are leveraging that, how they are doing it. And before we start, I, there's something I would like to say, which is, I know that I can talk really fast when I get excited about a topic. So if that's the case, please feel free to let me know. I will not feel offended. <laughs> you all to understand everything I say. So please, again, feel free to do it. Now, um, something really common when we talk about artificial intelligence is that maybe we focus a lot on a single topic. Maybe we start thinking a lot only about our own area. Maybe we're only talking about AP, I'm sorry, IT. Maybe we're only thinking about medicine, maybe about automotive industry. However, the main goal with this is to talk a little, a little about everything, how it's being used on medicine, photography, art, uh, automotive industry, and all of that. And that's the main goal here. Uh, the main goal is to be able to show you some examples of what's being done, how it's being used, hopefully to inspire you to create some of these tools, to improve them, and of course, to see all the benefits that we can get from artificial intelligence once it gets applied on something. Because maybe, I mean, ChatGPT is awesome, right? But without having the right context without doing something as specific, you might fall into doing technically anything uh, or at the same time doing technically nothing. And that's the main goal, just to focus on some ways to apply it, what's being done and what we'll be seeing. Now, in this case, Emer did an outstanding job explaining this. I do not plan to go too deep on it. He already talked about the history, how we went. Um, I don't necessarily need to talk about Tyree. We all know about Tyree and same with Alexa, but there is one in particular that I would like to talk about and that's tape from 2016. Maybe some of you already heard about it. It's an old news, but this one is a chatbot that was released by Microsoft on Twitter. And the main goal was to be a chatbot. That's what it does, right? However, after thousands and thousands of tests, it was working like a charm. It was beautiful. Yet when it was released to production, it didn't last more than 16 hours. It was only there for 20, yeah, 16 hours actually, less than, for 20, less, less than a day. Because as soon as it got online and it started getting trained by production data, by real people interacting with it, that algorithm started, well, that artificial intelligence started to get racist and homophobic because of the interaction with the people. So we're going to be talking about a lot of good implementations of artificial intelligence, but at the same time, I feel like you are only as good as your data and your data set. And it depends, of course, if you are supervised, unsupervised, and so on. But not everything is beautiful. And because of that, we need to be careful with the tools that we are creating, what we are doing, and so on. And besides that, of course, we know how it went, how we have ChatGPT nowadays. And I don't plan to focus a lot on this. I just wanted to talk a little about Tay because I feel like that's a really peculiar example, something that we don't see a lot because we always try to talk only about the good things. But as we saw in the previous presentation and on the Q&A session, there are some ugly things that can happen also. So we need to be aware of that and be sure that we are taking that into consideration, starting to implement this in different ways. Now, what benefits are we getting from artificial intelligence? A lot, right? But I have to summarize it in a few. So in this case, the first one will absolutely be automation and efficiency. It's like so many tasks that nowadays we need to do by ourselves. Now that we have the ability to have machines or algorithms or software that can learn by themselves some of these things allows us to automate those tasks. We don't need necessarily to be like, I mean, what, 15 years ago that it was only repetitive tasks that gets done over and over and over without needing to be aware of the environment. Of course, that gives us efficiency, which will give us better results, faster results, who will, which go along with accuracy. In this case, it helps us to validate what's being done. Is it proper? Is it what we want? I mean, in QA, I mean, if we get a way for an, an app to learn how, I'm sorry, how to use our own apps without actually a human input, that's awesome, right? And it applies to every industry. Maybe you are on the automotive industry and we will see some examples. It's not only me talking, don't worry. Um, but once you get into that, you actually have a way to get way so many things in such short amount of time and also leads to innovation because the things that we couldn't do 15 years ago, now there are ways to do it. The same way that a hundred years ago, it was not possible to do many things until we got the industrial revolution. Well, now we're in something similar, maybe not as huge, but still it's something really, really big that we might not be paying enough attention. 
In this case, uh, as the name says, right, right, I will be focusing a lot on the industries, uh, what's being done with them, and what type of, let's say, improvements we're seeing there and where we are going. In this case, I'm starting with the automotive industry. And there are many applications, of course. I mean, as I say, quality control. Uh, there are many ways to apply this, but it's really common on the assembly process to have quality control systems, which we will see in a few minutes, uh, in order to make sure that we are getting defective parts, not that the cars are getting smarter and so on. Well, you want actually something to be sure that it's properly validated. Autonomous vehicles, uh, we did talk a little about it on the previous presentation. This is a huge topic because maybe sometimes we dream to be. Maybe sometimes we are like the car driving by itself while you're sleeping, but that's really hard because a single mistake means taking, I mean, taking someone else's life or your own life and so on. So of course it's a sensitive topic, but we have many things. Again, traffic analysis, being able to get faster to different places, picking an optimal route, because sometimes we minimize that with the traveler problem. And the traveler problem is good, don't get me wrong. But now that you have all the tools that we have, now that we have, I don't know, uh, how Google Maps is aware of all of the traffic, now with everyone with their GPS and the ability to be like, hey, I know that there could be an accident or something happened here because traffic is slower. Yeah. Um, so there are many tools that allows us to make this bigger. Of course, user experience, we have voice recognition. Uh, it's safer because now you are able to speak to your car. You don't need to be like, uh, taking up the wheel to do something on the phone or whatever, you can just say an instruction and it will happen. Also, when it comes to custom configuration, I think at least for me, maybe you did, right? But for me, I wasn't aware of so many things that the cars do nowadays to remember your preferences, to be like, if you change a critical piece at some point, maybe some of you experienced that the car doesn't feel the same. It feels weird. I mean, you press the accelerator and it goes faster than usual or not the same. And as you keep using it, it, it starts getting used to your habits again. So there are so many things when it comes to this. And again, some of them, we never see them. And when it comes to this, I think that it's a common process. Man, I don't plan to be like, oh yeah, let's watch the video together. I plan to keep talking as we go through it. But for example, here we're talking about an assembly line process. And what they are doing is that they are taking pictures of some particular car pieces that they care about. In this case, they take care about the module, the version, and so on, because that's what they are going to be using on the assembly process to take the right part to the right place. And in this case, of course, we are using, using sorry, a lot of image, image recognition. Uh, it has a lot of vehicles being used as a training set, and it's using, of course, cameras to identify each part. So when it's going, it is like, okay, well, I can see the, the parts that are being trained, and I will decide where to take it, because even if you have the same car, there are different modules, right? And you don't want to, like the most expensive piece to be combined with another piece from the cheapest module. So that's a big deal. Same when you are analyzing the pieces. It's like, there could be millimetric defects there that maybe as a person will miss it. But once you train a uh, training set, right? Like here, where we, we are using, oh, sorry, a neural network. And may, well, they say that after a hundred images, it's good enough for it to do it on its own. Is it true or not? I don't know, but, this is still something, again, I keep using this word, right? But it's really useful because it minimizes human factor. And maybe a person will be able to do a lot of this, but a person is not always at its 100%. Sometimes you could be tired, you could make mistakes. The, the machine doesn't have that. And that's something really useful because again, minimizes servers, increases efficiency. It does a lot of things that are useful for the process. Same with smart traffic lights. At least in my opinion, this is something that I love. Uh, this is a company that actually uh, does this, which is offering services to have a smart traffic lights. It takes, uh, uses the cameras to look at the traffic. So with that, it can make decisions saying, oh, well, there are cars coming from this lane. There are people, there are bikes. And based on that, it can dynamically say, well, I will turn this green light. This one, wait, well, <laughs> this one will get red and so on, which for me is huge because number one, it makes, things way faster on traffic. We have all been at some point in traffic when the reds are, are red, you're only one there waiting and you're like, man, I, I should just pass it. And of course, you're not gonna do it. Or the other way around, you're walking, it's red for you, there are no cars coming, yet you're just there waiting. And you might feel tempted to do it. I have done it, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but still, it, 
it's something that helps a lot. It's not only about time and efficiency. It also helps a lot when it comes to reducing pollution. How much time in aggregated time do you get? I will just play it again while I keep talking, right? Um, so how much time do you get aggregated from all, all of those vehicles just waiting, doing nothing? Now go to a way bigger city and it, it actually starts to matter. It's not just like, oh, I was five minutes faster. It, it becomes a bigger solution, not just a traffic solution, but also goes with pollution and all of that, which again, at least for me, it's, it's big, it's important. And it's something that, well, a problem that for me, it was huge for years. And seeing something where cities are getting smarter to be able to do something about it, it's changed that at least for me, it, it's something that I like. And when it comes to autonomous vehicles, like come on, it's everybody's favorite topic, right? And we all love to see the car being right driven by itself and so on. Uh, I love how, in this case, the car is aware of its surroundings. It's like it has the sensors that we all have. However, it's using it in a different way for it to learn what is in the surroundings, how to take advantage of it, when it should be slow. This is fairly short, so I will just keep reproducing. But also, something that was brought up on the previous presentation, and it's really important, is how much is enough. You cannot let it do everything on its own. And the nice part is that nowadays, autonomous cars are aware of that. For example, it's not displayed here because the guy is saying it and I, it felt uh, not worth putting it, but at some point, it's gonna get through the tunnel. The AI for this car, at least in particular, is not really good on tunnels. It, it knows that it doesn't recognize it properly. So using uh, the GPS, it actually knows that it's getting in a tunnel. It says, you know what, I cannot do this. It gets read and it gives him a time frame to say, if you don't grab the wheel in this amount of time, I will stop because I cannot do that and I will not take that risk. So please do it by yourself because I know my limitations as an artificial intelligence and I'm gonna compromise your security or other people's security, which for me, it's huge because I always felt that autonomous cars were just yeah, right, whatever you want. And we also saw those news about accidents and so on. But seeing how the algorithms, uh, the actual intelligence that they are getting is allowing them to, they, to make those decisions, uh, for, for me, it's a great way to move forward because it's not so ambitious to try to do everything. It's just try to do what you can little by little and you will eventually get there, uh, which is, again, baby steps. It's not about trying to do everything in a single attempt. And, that's, I think, the way to move forward with this type of stuff. By the way, before I keep moving forward, am I talking too fast? Is it fine? Oh, oh, something. <laughs> now, when it comes to the medical industry applications, right? Uh, we, have, we have surgery assistants, which are great. I mean, similar to autonomous vehicles, uh, we have a surgery assistant that is not doing everything on its own. I don't want the machine in front of me with a knife being able to do whatever it wants. So I'm happy that that's the case but it still helps to increase the precision, reduce the risk of a problem with the, with the surgery. And of course, like the ability to discover new drugs, maybe you know some combinations. I mean, I'm not a pharmaceutical person, but you know that there are some drugs that work in one way or another, and there are some side effects and so on. But once you have an algorithm that knows how to do these things, that knows um, technically how to combine it properly, maybe what will be I don't know, let's say one year worth of research with this, doing everything on its own, it's actually three months, five months. <laughs> uh, I think that with COVID, most of us were aware, well, we all of, uh, all of us had a lot of time to spare with COVID. We were reading all over the place and checking everything. At some point, maybe some of you found that there were tools working like cryptocurrency right now, where you're mining cryptocurrency, well, you were offering your computational power to actually power an AI to try to look for a cure for, the, for COVID. So again, I mean, this maybe highly likely is part of what helped to get away from that in two years. If it wasn't because of that, maybe we'll still be locked out. So it's, I think, a big application of what happened not so many years ago. And all the rest, I think that are pretty similar. I mean, I, I decided to make them different bullets, but at the end of the day, uh, being with a remote medical diagnosis, monitoring patients' health and figuring out if something's gonna happen out of there, a remote medical attention, which, which, which is huge on areas where medical attention is not that easy. And of course, the prevention and prediction of health issues, it's huge because maybe you can get a radiography, maybe you can get a picture. Like there are people who just with a picture 
can get, uh, I'm sorry, there are algorithms, not people, that with a picture can get fairly close on detecting some diseases. Maybe a flu or something simple, right? But still, just a picture is good enough. And for us, it might not be a big deal. I mean, we have doctors all over the place, but on some communities, that could be a big, big, big difference. And actually, when it comes to this, for example, uh, the AI assisted your surgery, as I told you, uh, this is not a machine doing it on its own. It is actually just a machine helping you to complement what you might not know. Uh, I don't know what those subtitles say, only the ones at the bottom, right? But still, uh, there are many factors that affect you here. For example, you have different body complexions for people, and that might mean that the organs are slightly in different places. Once you have that, and the artificial intelligence can help you a little with that, of course, and the precision of the tools and so on, you might know how much you need to cook. Because again, a skinny person, the organs are closer to the skin. Someone with overweight, it might be harder. You might be more prone to actually cook more than what you should and cause some damage. So these type of tools actually help to leverage that a little more to make it a little easier. Maybe not easier, less complex because this is complex stuff, let's be honest. And it's, let's say, a way to complement it the same way we were talking about the autonomous vehicles because it's not trying to do everything. And it's, this is even more dangerous than an autonomous vehicle. Like, come on, you have a tool trying to do it on its own, like opening a person and they doing whatever operation they need to do and then closing it. That, that's a big deal. And we don't want that around. Now, when it comes to disease detection, in this case, as I was saying, there are scenarios with pictures, there are scenarios where it's a more complex analysis. But for me, this one is important because uh, that note that I did put at the beginning with where it says that artificial intelligence are, is equal to experts when it comes to detecting diseases, that note is actually from five years ago. It's 2018, and we were already at that point. We were already at the point where virtual machine is really similar to experts in that area, which it should not be uh, confused with the expert systems that were um, Imer was talking about on the previous presentation, uh, on his presentation, of course. This is not like an expert system like a deep blue on, with chess that was like, I only know this and only care about this. I mean, this is learning. This keeps getting better. So it's actually something that does help a lot. It is a huge advancement when it comes to that because, again, I keep saying it, but not everyone has the same opportunities. Not every country has the same level of service when it comes to medical assistance and having the ability to do things, maybe not from home, right? It's not like you're taking a selfie and hey, what, what, what disease do I have? But still, I mean, having some medical analysis, sending it to a, something like this and being able to get an accurate result can be big and can be a game changer in so many ways. Now, when it comes to nutrition, this is a personal example, actually. So for me, at least for me, I don't know how it is here, but when you're asking for a diet plan, most of the time what I see is they have 100 patients with the same diet plan. You go there and they're like, yeah, yeah, take it. Oh, do you want to lose weight? Yeah, take this. Oh, are you going to the gym and you want to bulk? Oh yeah, take this. And that's all. They reuse the same for almost every single person. And something I really like is that when she was making this experiment with ChatGPT, I was like, hey, let's see what it says. And let's see how much I can push it. So I was like, hey, I want a diet plan for whatever you want of me. And it was, I didn't want to show the entire conversation because that was like cheerleading lines with all the diet plan, but it, it's giving me something. And then I am like, oh, wait, I only want uh, uh, this amount of calories intake. Can you please update it? Oh, yeah, this is the new diet plan, but now with this amount of calories. Oh, nice. Oh, wait, I forgot to tell you, I'm vegan. Can you update it now for a vegan person? Yeah, there it is. And then I was like, oh, but, but I also don't eat gluten. Can you update it again? And date it in two minutes, which again, I mean, it falls a little into when we start saying, wait, can an artificial intelligence take my, oh, away my, my job from me? And not necessarily. I was talking about a really bad example where they are reusing everything, right? But if you have a good neurologist, we will actually be like, yeah, let me take your measurements. How, how many corporal fat do you have? That, 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 that. Well, that gets more specialized. But when it comes to simple stuff like this, just this without caring about anything else, it's great. It's like, literally, it's an expert on so many topics. It keeps learning. It was told on, on the previous presentation. I will not go deeper into that, but it keeps getting better and it will keep getting better. Same when we talk about financial services. I mean, we are 
if they are victims of the success or the failure when it comes to this fraud detection. I don't know if it happens to you. I don't know if it's coming here, but for me, every time I try to buy something that I don't usually buy, like really, really, really outside of my expense habits, I get my credit card locked. It sucks when you're actually using it, right? But when it was someone else doing it, I mean, you're so grateful it happened. And that's because of the anomaly detection algorithms that are many. You could be using, I don't know, a neural network for that, uh, a support vector machine, any of that. So it's, it's still a way that we are taking either the advantage or disadvantage. Again, it depends. Forecasting algorithms. It helps not only for fin financial institutions that are doing a stock trading or any of that. We can do it here. We can calculate our budget. We can be like, yeah, we expect to hire so many people or based in our growth habits, we expect that by 2025 without a person actually doing, the, doing it, uh, a manual calculation, but, be, but being able to actually just say, uh, forget the name, sorry. It's like, I'm sorry, forget the, completely forgot the name, but it is a regression algorithm. I got it out of nowhere. A regression algorithm so that it can actually calculate. It can do it and it can, it can try to, predict where it's gonna go. And for me, uh, something that summarizes all of this, like risk detection, improved security, of course, I mean, security is a complementary topic here, but still it's really important. Uh, when we talk about trading bots, that's pretty big for me because it's trying to do everything. It's using forecasting algorithms to try to learn how the prices are gonna change in the future. It's using, of course, all the trading algorithms to decide because there are some rules, well, not rules, just some, how can I say it, patterns that sometimes can tell you if something is gonna change or not. So it, it, it's kind of an expert system when it comes to that, but it still gets complemented with the rest. Uh, risk detection, because you want to reduce the, the loss. You are not like, oh yeah, do whatever you want. You want to be sure that you're actually making money. And of course, all of that gets together when it comes to that. I think that many of us, uh, maybe what will be eight years ago, got into the cryptocurrency craziness in 2017. We tried to do it on our own. We were trying to predict everything. Some succeeded, some failed miserably, but many people using these bots actually made a lot of money <laughs> and they are still doing it. Even on the current bearish market, I will not get a lot into that, that's not the topic, right? But still, I mean, it shows how that works. And a lot of financial institutions are getting into that in many ways. I mean, maybe when it comes to approving your loan for your car or your house, when it comes to deciding if you are actually something, someone worth of being trusted to have, I don't know, let's say a better credit limit or just a credit card, how many times you got rejected by that when you didn't work yet. So um, it's, it is still something to get that it's growing and it's giving a lot of money on the financial institutions. So, I mean, it's being broadly used. We know that it's not for everybody. Uh, some people do not want to take that risk and it's completely understandable, I mean, it's not something that you will easily take like, hey, yeah, a machine will be doing any from everything for me and something that I have been doing for 15 years. I took this company from, from, from zero and now I will let the machine do everything. Absolutely not. So it, it's just some of the applications on the financial industry. Now, I was talking a lot about the core industries, like the main ones, but there are also support industries. Uh, let's say, let's call it industries that are a little into everything. Like for example, art is a really controversial topic, right? Uh, you have training sets and you're training that with art that could be protected by copyright. And it's a big problem. However, this is still useful. You can use something like this to generate your own stock images without getting worried. You still might because of copyright, right? But you're not worried about, oh, I picked this image from Google, it has copyright, oh boy. Now you can generate your own, generate stock music. You have quality improvements made on the fly. You're not the one actually clicking on everything. It's actually learning where are those problems. And for me, at the very least, these tools were amazing because it is like something as random as saying Mary Poppins fighting Joe Biden in a boxing match and it produces an image, an image for you like, ow. <laughs> or just want to be like really specific, right? A stunning, hyper-realistic giraffe with good quality and blah, blah, blah. And it generates that for you. Maybe this looks silly because it's like a random example, but at the same time, let's talk about designers that are like, hey, maybe I'm designing the new character for a movie and I want the antagonist. I want him to be a, a guy with an eye patch who loves the purple color and has this 
uh, how can I say, characteristics, and it can be generated for you. Maybe you're a video game designer and you are going to create your protagonist. So, oh yeah, a Viking warrior who wears an axe and blah, blah, blah. It gets generated for you. It has many ways to use it. And this is not simple thing. Like being able to create something like that by just a natural language processing, it's a lot, a lot of effort. And it's something that is gonna get even better. It's for me, at least this is amazing. When I was playing with the tool, Sometimes I was getting some really, really, really ugly results, but some others were amazing. And when doing this for me, it was something really, really cool. Then marketing, like how many times have we been, have we been talking about something and five minutes later, we started seeing ads for that. I mean, there are many things involved with that, especially when it comes to speech recognition. How many times we think about something and we start seeing ads for that. And we are like, what is this thing really in my mind or what? And it's actually just pattern recognition. You have similar patterns on things that you were looking for, you were talking about <laughs> just that, uh, to other people who were doing the same. And the system was like, you know what? Maybe you have never said that you wanted some, I don't know, dancing shoes, but all of the things that you've been looking for are really similar to other people who were looking for that. So I will try it. And sometimes they do succeed. Some other times you get random stuff that you don't care about, right? but still that falls a little into, into the recommendation systems and what you're providing as an input. Um, the really old example that I, but I, I still love that example is the target scenario. When target figured out that a teen was pregnant before her father did, it's mainly because of her buying habits were similar to a pregnant, pregnant woman. And because of that target was suddenly starting to suggest things for babies. And it, that's like, it's like how your like the thin line between your privacy and the actual data mining, the artificial intelligence, data gathering, and so on get together because I think we are, or we are all afraid at some point of what we are saying in front of our phone. Uh, when we have our laptop and we have a, a, some that tape on it to be sure that uh, they are not spying on me. And it's 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 interesting, right? Because from in one side, it seems harmless because it's like Amazon, Target, Google, do, re do really they care about me? Are they gonna do something with my data against me? I will say no. The main problem becomes when you get a data breach and that data breach has a way to get that data related to you. Now they know what you talk about, what you like. I mean, not necessarily be bad. If you're a public figure, now that can become a problem. And I mean, the main focus on this, I know we want to talk about the cool stuff, about the good things we can do, but there are also bad things that can be done. And I think it is important to do that. I mean, when it comes to artificial intelligence, we always want bigger data sets. We always want more data. We always want more, more and more because that's, what, that's gonna make it better. But at the same time, it's like, being sure that that's being protected properly. And it was brought up on the previous uh, presentation when they were talking about, hey, how can you be sure that I'm the one talking? At least in my, in my, my bank, they decided to drop a lot of security to rely on biometrics. And I just need to say a phrase. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> and that's good enough for them to give me access. I mean, it's cool, right? But maybe not the smartest decision based on what we were talking about. Just repeat the phrase, please. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> And it's funny because, I mean, this was not part of the presentation, I'm going to be honest. But last night I was talking with some of the guys, we were discussing about this topic, and it's really like, how can I say it? I mean, it's just scary because now you have tools that can hear to 10 seconds of your voice, and now they can start imitating it to say different things. Now you have ways to take a picture out of someone, of the, uh, make an algorithm to do something with it, like, hey, I'm here and now uh, made me wear a uh, weird hat and some, uh, I don't know, pink coat, and it looks real. Now, where's the difference between reality and, and how can I say it, made up stuff, let's call it in some way, and now where's the limit on what can you do with that? Again, like the example where it can take my voice. That can be really bad. Not just because, oh, the password on my bank account. It is also on, on things like, how can I say it, uh, maybe faking that I'm someone. That I'm not like the example where where do you know that I'm the one calling or it is a robot? Uh, again, I'm sorry, this wasn't part of it, but once I was talking about it, 
I felt like it was good to bring up that because at least for me, it was a really good discussion that we had last night. And it felt like it was worth mentioning that not everything is beautiful, not every, everything are roses. Uh, there are things where we need to be careful because we are the ones creating a lot of these things, or we want to be the ones creating many of these things. And because of that, we need to be aware of that. Now, as a consumer, yeah, we talked about marketing, how it comes to suggesting a stuff for you and so on. But as a consumer, it's supposed to be really useful for you. I, I don't know how you are with this, but for me, when I want to buy something that I'm new to that, I start searching like crazy. I might spend three days just going through every single page. I, I Maybe I want to get a new PC and I'm looking for a motherboard. Oh, but wait, this one is $30 more expensive than this. Maybe this one is slightly better. Maybe not. And I start doing research like crazy. So in this example, I like tennis. So I wanted to buy a new tennis racket. I wasn't sure between two. And I was like doing my research. There's so much bias on so many internet pages. Like, oh yeah, we're sponsored. So this is the best one. And because of that, I was like, okay, let, let me simplify it a little. Let me try asking ChatGPT. And I was like, yeah, well, general, of course. At least I always like to start general. Uh, can you help me with a new tennis racket? Oh yeah, you need to take all of this into consideration and I can help you. Okay, well, I, I'm trying to choose between these two are the ones that I'm looking at. Uh, I want to, uh, uh, control more focused on control. So please, can you help me with that? And he starts telling me, oh yeah, if you like this, this one is better because da, 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 da. maybe this example uh, doesn't click on many people because they don't care about that, right? But once you get into something way deeper, like choosing a car, like when I was choosing my car, I spent like three weeks doing research just to make sure that I was getting what I wanted. And once you're able to say like, hey, hey, ChatGPT, you know what? I'm trying to decide between, uh, I don't know, a Kia Optima uh, SX module versus, uh, I don't know, let's say a Honda Civic. Uh, I don't know the models and Hondas, but anyway. And it can give you the differences. Like, hey, the um, oil consumption, I'm sorry, not gas consumption, and how fast you can get, how good it is. And it, it does help you a lot because instead of going through many pages that could have a lot of bias by many reviewers, by many, many people like that, now you're able to do it on your own. I know that this is supposed to be more uh, focused on industries, but I also feel like as a consumer, you also have your benefits. I mean, it's the small wins that we can get out of it. Now, when it comes to workplace security, for me, this is unique because how many accidents do we have in fabrics or dangerous places at the, the, at the end of the day? So they have these tools that allows you to be like, okay, I want to be sure that you are not on restricted areas without the proper equipment. Without that, uh, you are prone to accidents, maybe without a gas mask and you can be breathing something that is dangerous for you, something that can expose your skin. So in this case, uh, he doesn't have uh, neither gloves or, or helmet, so he cannot go there. Now he has the helmet, doesn't have the gloves, still can get there, but once he has both, he has the ability to get in there. And sometimes we are like, well, but how silly can it be to get into a dangerous area without the proper equipment? It happens where my, more often that we should think about it. It's so common. I mean, at least, I will say at least 10 people in this room know someone who will at least know someone who had an accident at a fabric or whatever. So it's, it's just those little things. It's not the game changer. It's not getting a medical attention remotely. It is not getting a cart that drives on its own. Maybe it doesn't look as impressive, but once we start looking at those implementations, but what those little things can do for people, because this is not only saving people lives, don't get me wrong, that's important, but also helps companies to reduce risk, the, the risk that they have. Like the, uh, what's the name? The, the, I forgot the name to be honest, but it's how much you, pra you pay uh, because of potential accidents that are happening insurance. in your company. Insurance, thank you. Yeah, the, the insurance uh, cost, it can go down. Uh, you can avoid uh, maybe some legal uh, problems with people and employees and so on. So it doesn't look that big, but it gives a huge benefit. And I think that that's one of the main things that we will need to start focusing on some, at some point, which is the ability to look for those little things that can make a big difference. And that will definitely be a game changer in so many ways. Because once we start focusing on those little things, don't only look at the huge things that everyone are talking about, that can be different. That's where, where we can actually innovate. And now, I think that this is the common question that we are, are going to make ourselves during these presentations, which is, can an actual, can an actually an artificial intelligence steal my job? Short answer is yes, but let's go deeper into it because it's not that simple. Now, when I talk about, well, when I think, sorry, about artificial intelligence, 
and what we are doing nowadays, I said at the beginning, I like to think a little about the industrial revolution because what happened before, we have many people doing a lot of manual labor, things that maybe could not be done the way they are done right now, like manufacturing cars in mass, come on. I mean, even if we had cars back then, people doing it manually will not even be close to what we do nowadays. So repetitive tasks were automated, things that were too hard for people to do now are easily done in a matter of minutes. You don't have people getting tired, uh, making mistakes or any of that. And for me, that's big because it's really similar to what we're seeing nowadays. Repetitive tasks that can be avoided. And um, actually, I forgot to change it. Uh, repetitive tasks that can be avoided, they can be done faster, they can be more accurate. And now we have a lot of room for innovation. There are so many things. And now we could get a car, like it's doing a, like a car design that is being done with artificial intelligence. You are not actually the one making the design and so on. You can get an AI to do it for you. And it's, it's really similar in some way. Now, isn't this similar to other technologies improvements? I mean, we see it all day long. We all have been there when there were some big changes for our area. Actually, here I was wanted to talk a little about, about our area because I felt like it's worth it. But how we have been evolving with cloud technologies, infrastructure as a service, does it mean that now we don't have uh, infrastructure people? Of course not. Uh, same with IDEs, frameworks, uh, scaffolders, uh, all of those things that you get done automatically, does it mean that you don't have developers now? Of course not. It's just you learn how to use the tools, how to leverage them properly, how to get more proficient with it, get efficient. And with that, you have a competitive advantage. It's not about the machines taking your job. It is just to learn how to use them and to adapt so that you can be better. I mean, how can I say it? It wasn't that long ago that people were coding on Notepad and they were building everything on the console and just to see that, oh, I lost, I missed a semicolon. I need to go back. Now we have all the IntelliSense, all of those things. We have ChatGPT, Git Copilot, Tab9, all of those things that actually help us to make things in a better way, to be more performant. And the real challenge is to be able to learn how to use that. And not only for us, I'm talking about every industry. If you get stuck on what you have been doing for 50 years, yeah, a machine can take your job, but it, it applies to everything. Even when we were just having some baby steps, it doesn't change the fact that you must always remain updated. And that's the main thing. I mean, uh, for me, uh, that's all. I just wanted to talk a little about the parts because it felt like when it comes to our field, uh, sometimes we miss that. So uh, that's all from my side. So we have uh, three minutes for questions, which means we can take two maximum. There you go. I actually have a question, not for Arnoldo, but for Dino. And uh, AI in financial industries, uh, like you, you have been through a lot. Um, you, you have many friends who, who are in, in different um, places in, in, in finance industry. So, I'm curious to hear from from you firsthand what what do you find uh, and do, do you think uh, we're gonna need people let's say in five or ten years and and, and what, what how, how is that how is their role going to change in this industry? Uh, short answer is in a lot of areas no we won't need people. Um, one of my good friends in New York he is a trader for Goldman Sachs. He's a MIT computer scientist by trade. So all he does is work on the algorithms to create for them. He doesn't make those that we saw. And it is much more successful than the old guys who were taking stock deposits, becoming increasingly, increasingly harder for an individual to outperform the regime, especially in something like the stock market, where there are so many players and it's very, very hard to turn them. So and you can say that for all sorts of jobs in financial services, loan underwriting. The machines simply make better decisions. Than so, lots of use cases. Um, yeah, and I see it all over the place. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Do we have any online people? So, it's called the industry. Is there any ones that are particularly bold? To be like uh, where the workers can be replaced by AI. Yeah. <laughs> Pleasure, right? I mean, I will say any repetitive task can easily be replaced. Uh, when it comes to a particular industry, 
let's be honest, our industry, when it comes to the lo lowest level, right? When it comes to really basic stuff, it is a big risk here. I mean, I it, there is a common joke that goes that says that as long as the clients uh, don't know exactly, exactly what they want, uh, it's actually not going to be a real danger. But still, I mean, if you have someone who knows exactly what he wants, it's really dangerous. And of course, yeah. I'm talking about simple applications. Once you go into something really complex with really specific business logic, it's a completely different story. But once we go to the lowest levels of our area, I feel like that's where it is dangerous. Maybe not the most dangerous, but at least that I'm aware, I will say that that one is one of them. Thank you, Inner. Uh, that will be it. Another round of applause for.